Legend of Total War here, and today we're doing another Top 5 Total War video. This time covering the Top 5 Richest Total War Factions. So these are the factions that have the easiest time over other factions in their respective games of getting a big fat bank account. So with that being said, let's jump in now to number 5. Coming in at number 5 is Venice in Medieval 2 Total War. Now it was actually kind of difficult to distinguish one faction from another when it comes down to who's better at making money in this game. Nobody gets any particular faction-wide bonuses, everybody's able to recruit merchants, everybody's able to obtain any particular city. So what is it about Venice that makes them the richest? And it's not by a huge margin, but they do have some of the best starting settlements in the game. They have Venice, which is one of the few actually stone-walled settlements in the game. It's not the best settlement in the game. That's got to go to Constantinople or Jerusalem. But given the location, there is a lot of trade going on in the Adriatic. And that's not the only settlement they have, of course. Of course, they've got Ragusa, good settlement, also connected to the, the trade routes. They've got Crete, also a good settlement. It's not very large, but you can build it up fairly quickly. And then they've also got access to Zagreb very early on. You can get that literally on turn one. And Zagreb has access to gold. So you can, as Venice, be the first person to put a merchant on there and get a whopping 51 gold per turn. Now, I've always dissed merchants, but with Venice, it is a bit more of a viable strategy than, say, as England, putting it on a fish and getting five gold per turn. Merchants with Venice do a lot better because they start off a lot more elongated, meaning that... If you recruit a merchant in Crete and send him, for example, over to here, it doesn't take a lot of time and you can make a lot of money since the distance to capital from the first resource when it comes to merchant acquisition is the way to make money. Most other factions in this game have to take a lot longer to get anywhere with that kind of stuff. So in this, Venice is able to accumulate a lot more cash with fewer territories at the start of the game and that's why it's getting the number five spot. Let's move on now to number four. Coming in at number four is Ma Teng in Total War Three Kingdoms. So there's two reasons why he makes more money than everyone else. Firstly, he gets a plus 100% bonus to wealth from silk and spices. He's very close to pretty much all of the Silk Road. So he can obtain the entirety of silk very early on, making him a really fat bank account. He starts off with one, but Make your way up through the Silk Road and you'll you'll get more. Now, the other thing, and this is sort of a bigger deal, it's not necessarily about making money, but about reducing costs. So if you manage to firstly get the Silk Road, and then secondly, get all the horse pastures that are nearby, because this is where most of the horse stuff are, because Marteng's army base is mostly cavalry. That's his best troops. And you're going to want to recruit your best troops, right? you got a lot of enemies to fight in this game. So you're going to have to recruit a lot of armies. Well, what if I told you that you could reduce your army upkeep by up to 100% if you manage to get all of the the the, uh, the tribal horse hosts? Because each one of those that you get will reduce the upkeep for your cavalry unit by 20% faction-wide. Now, there's some difficulty levels where, for example, legendary difficulty, where you receive a penalty to your upkeep costs anyway, and so it's kind of impossible to get free horses but still you're able to reduce it by so much and in some cases still be able to reduce to 100% largely depends on the general that you have that he's got almost free armies so coupled with the fact that he makes a ton of money from silk and the fact that he doesn't really have to pay very much for his troops quite easily to obtain then that's why he gets the number four spot that's how he makes so much money increase income decrease expenses that's how you get rich Anyway, let's now move on to number three. Coming in at number three is Great Britain in Empire Total War. Now, this explanation here will probably take a little bit longer than what's usual, because it's pretty complex on how to get filthy rich in Empire Total War. Now, there's two main contenders in this game for using this particular technique, one of them being Great Britain, the other one being Spain. Now, I'm going to argue the point that Great Britain has a much easier time of doing this than Spain, but it is certainly viable doing it with Spain as well. Now, Great Britain, how do they make a ton of money? One of the best ways to make money in the early game is not through conquering territories. Take the Ottoman Empire, for example. It's the largest faction in the game at the start, and it's poor as fuck. And that's largely because most of its regions are poor, 
as is the case with most regions in the game at the start. And the more regions you own, the more it increases your maintenance. So as you expand, you end up making less money from your territories as a whole. And so you get to a point where you're taking new territories, but you're actually losing money because it's just not that valuable. Later in the campaign, totally fine to conquer as many territories as you want, but at the beginning, not so much. One way around this is, of course, trading, because you don't need to obtain lots of territories in order to get trade goods. You just need a strong fleet. Who's got the strongest fleet? Great Britain. So, you send your fleet over to the various trade nodes around the place, establish monopolies wherever you can, and import these resources back to Great Britain, and then send it off to your trade partners. Now, you only need one trade agreement, just one. So make sure you've always got at least one, because you can export all of your goods to one person. But if your ports get blockaded or their ports get blockaded, this technique will stop working, which is why you have to maintain a strong fleet. Now, while Spain can do this as well, one thing that Spain's going to have at their disadvantage that Great Britain doesn't have to worry about so much is actually defending their territory. Great Britain is one of the most defensible territories in the game because it's very hard for the AI to actually invade it because all you need to do is put ships in your port and then they struggle to land armies there. You can intercept them as they're coming in and your fleet will, generally speaking, unless you've really neglected it, will beat any fleet that the AI is going to send at you. So... Defending your territory being a lot easier will reduce your expenses. Now, Spain, on the other hand, has to defend Madrid, which is reasonably defensible because it's big, but it's also got other territories out here. Now, unless you want to just give them up in the early game, which you totally can do because you don't need them, they're probably actually going to weaken you, but, you know, you're giving up territory, losing progress, and then you've only got one settlement where... Great Britain's got three, all nestled in one spot. You don't have to worry too much. Defending one is the same as defending others. Ireland's extremely defensible because it's just too far away to even bother attacking. Now, the next way of making money, this is a little bit awkward, is to feed, your ter feed territory to your vassals. Both Spain and England, or Great Britain, start off with a colony. So you've got New Spain over here, and then you've got the 13 colonies. Now, one thing I discovered during my Blitz campaign is that... If you, it's totally viable to feed territory to your vassals, uh, to your colony, because what's going to happen is, as of turn two, you get a mission where if you conquer three specific settlements, then you just get to annex all of the territory made uh, from the thirteen colonies. So what you do is you conquer the the various territories in the new world or even in the old world, in it in Europe. For example, you're playing as England, you conquer France, right? Now holding on to France is an absolute pain. Right? It's got a lot of public order problems, which is the case with any major capital. But what you can do is right before you annex annex the 13 colonies, right before you take the third region that you need to take, give it to the 13 colonies, and then when you annex the 13 colonies, it will wipe clean all public order problems, thus sorting your problems out with that. Spain can do it as well, but I've always found that it's a lot easier to do with Great Britain. And that's how you make an absolute ton of money as as Great Britain. You can conquer territories without having to worry about overextending yourself. You get overextended, give a territory over to the new colonies. When you're ready to annex them, it's not hard to do so. And then the other thing is, of course, trading like crazy, which is very easy to do with Great Britain. And that's why they're getting a the number three spot. Let's move on now to number two. Okay, so at this point in the video, I do want to make a clear distinction that the video is mainly about the next two. The previous three, whilst I do believe that they are specifically rich factions, they're almost nothing in comparison to what comes after. Coming in at number two is a faction that's part of the Warhammer 2 game, but which race is it? I'm sure a number of you would uh, guess at certain races. Some of you would be correct, some of you won't be correct. Some of you might think it's the Dwarves. They do make a lot of money through their mining. Some of you might think it's the Skaven because they make a lot of money through their Undercities. Some of you might even think it's the Dark Elves who make a lot of money through their uh, slavery mechanic. But if you guessed any of those, you are incorrect, because the correct answer is High Elves. The High Elves are the richest faction in this game by a huge margin. And if you understand how their mechanics work, you can easily get, ac get access to their immense wealth very early on in the campaign. So what exactly did I do in this particular campaign? I do have the whole map, and that is not deceiving you there. This is vanilla off the current version. Uh, and that's 1.8 million profit per turn. I didn't disband my armies, so my actual income is 2 million per turn. 
So, how did I manage to do this? Well, the High Elves have a pretty unique mechanic in that their the bulk of their income doesn't actually come from their buildings or from trade. It actually comes from their agents, from their heroes, if you understand how to use them. And I'll show you why. So we'll come down here to where I've really maxed it out. And you might think, oh my god, that's a lot of agents. And it is. So it turns out that every agent has a max limit of 100. You cannot recruit more than 100 of any particular agent. But using the High Elves um, influence mechanic, you can hire specifically good traited um, agents. Now, there are two of their heroes that have a specific trait called Entrepreneur. The Handmaidens can get it and the Mages can get it. Now, the thing is, the Mages in this game, because they have access to five Lords of Magic, you can actually see this Entrepreneur trait appear pretty, pretty often with the Mages. So you'll be able to recruit a lot of these pretty early on. You don't have to disband and re-recruit them just to just to refresh the the uh, the pool. So what does it do? It provides a tax rate plus three percent faction wide, and income from all buildings plus thirty percent in the local province. Now some people look at that tax rate plus three percent and scoff at it. Oh, that's not very much. No, it doesn't seem like very much. But here's the thing: it compounds on itself because that tax rate also multiplies whatever the income increase is from all buildings. So that tax rate is also increasing the income from the buildings in the province. So what ends up happening if you put them in your richest base province region, so it has the base amount of wealth, and then pop on all of that extra tax, you're going to get something like this. So in my Lothurn province, I have nearly 500,000 income per turn. That's just from Lothurn with a tax rate of 450%. If we go to any other province in, that I have on the map, taxes are at 450%. Even if I go to Norska, arguably the poorest regions in the game, we're still looking at 12,500 per turn. Now here's the thing, I haven't actually maxed out this mechanic because handmaidens can get it too, and I just haven't quite recruited that many of them because there's only one chain of of handmaidens and they just don't show up that often but any times that they did show up in the campaign I went and recruited one now that doesn't quite end it there there's a little bit more you can do on top of it because you can get nobles they don't have to stand in any particular yours. province but they have a skill at level 10 where they can increase income from industry buildings or port regions or entertainment buildings or regions which by the way is amplified even further by the tax rate so what ends up happening when we recruit a new noble? I await your command. Didn't increase our income. Okay, keep an eye on that number. A promising left so let's increase our income from industry by 3%. And it went up by about 7,500. So you can start to see how ridiculous that the, the income for the high elves can get. Even though there is an upper limit to it, uh, you can start to see you know, hundreds of thousands of income come in pretty early on in the campaign, but even if you only own Ulthuan, just by keeping as many entrepreneurs in your home territory as possible. And that's why they get the number two slot. Now it's actually time to move on to the richest faction in a Total War game. I'm sure a lot of you will be able to guess what this is. This faction has just the literally unlimited potential. But anyway, moving on to the number one pick. Coming in at number one is the Eastern Roman Empire in Total War Attila. This faction is so economically broken that I'm surprised that the spiffing Brit has yet to make a perfectly balanced video with no exploits exploiting the Eastern Roman Empire's economic potential. So, if you're having a look at the numbers there and your mouth is agape, don't worry, I'll explain it. This is this is normal as well. Well, sort of. So let's go in and I'll start explaining why, why are they so broken. You don't, don't even need territory. You don't even need taxes as the Eastern Roman Empire. You just need a little bit of understanding. So currently we have an income of profit per turn of 105,370,121 gold. That makes the high off campaign that I just showcased look like nothing. It's literally 50 times higher than it and with less turns with far less effort put into it. And we have a treasury of 2,108,114,767 gold. That's how much money we have to play around with in this 
turn right at the moment. I'm currently 195 turns into the campaign. There's no mods, no nothing. What have I done to do this? Well, to be honest, I did nothing. The way to get absolute ass loads of cash with the Eastern Roman Empire is to just not spend money. That's all you have to do. So what I did at the beginning of the campaign is abandoned all of my initial start territories, except for Egypt, because what that does is, for one thing, gets us a lot of initial capital, about 120,000, and also reduces our upkeep costs, because I was able to disband most of my armies, because I didn't need to fight on all fronts anymore. I only had to worry about a few frontiers, which reduced my, uh, my upkeep costs considerably, so that I could make interest off it. So at the beginning of the campaign, with 120,000 gold, I was able to get, I don't know, about 6,000 gold per turn in interest. But then I didn't spend it. I just held on to very small armies and kept defending our territories with very little. And eventually 6,000 gold with interest turned into 12,000 gold, then 24,000 gold, then 48,000 gold. And then eventually it got to 105 million gold per turn where I could hire eight full stack armies of elite troops and it not even take a dent into my income without having to control very much territory at all. And it's all thanks to their interest, interest mechanic. They're the only faction in the history of Total War that's got this mechanic, and that's why they're so broken. Now, we're at the point as well where we're about to break the game, in that if I press end turn, I'll actually lose everything, because it, you can see here it says the next turn I'll have negative 2 billion income. You might think, how is that possible? Like I said, this is at the point of breaking the game. Every number in a program is assigned a limit to how much it can count. So in Total War Attila, the treasury income number is a 32-bit signed integer and what that means is that the the game or the program can count between a number of negative 2.147 billion and positive uh, 2.147 billion any number that exceeds those limitations will instantly render a like a problem and it will just reset straight to zero so next turn when my income essentially when my treasury gets to 2.2 billion it'll exceed the 32-bit signed integers capabilities and then reset straight to zero and all of this will be for nothing so there's certainly things that you can do to prevent this from occurring all i have to do is go into diplomacy and give away 100 million gold so that i can basically make sure that my current income doesn't exceed the the 32-bit integer and that's why the Eastern Roman Empire is the richest faction in Total War history and also the most broken with its, uh, with its economics. And I'll just end the video with a little clip for your enjoyment. And we'll see you next time, fuckers. Okay, you had a balance of 93 cents. All right. And at an average of 2.25% interest over a period of 1,000 years, that comes to $4.3 billion. <laughs> Ha <laughs> <laughs>